Well, good morning, everyone. Um, happy last day of April. Welcome to the Ottawa Board of Trade webinar series. Uh, we're so pleased to have everyone here. This is a virtual event series that we have created over the course of the last seven weeks uh, in response to uh, our situation currently with COVID-19 and in an effort to continue to offer value to our members um, by way of uh, connecting you with each other uh, by promoting some of our member businesses and by offering the opportunity for our local leaders to uh, connect with you and share their expertise and their experience um, as a way of giving you information inspir and inspiration. So we're very excited to have uh, this series going on and very grateful to our community partner, The Ottawa Citizen, as well as our event partners, Enbridge Inc. and Media Mall, and especially uh, grateful to be able to welcome our presentation partners today, uh, Carla Bionis, um, consulting and Ruckify. And so we have the uh, owners and CEOs of those two organizations presenting uh, today. So uh, my name is, I may have not said, my name is Suleng Ching. I'm the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade, and it is my honor to serve this business community. Um, I will say that all of us have um, had a challenging time over the last few weeks. Uh, our Board of Trade has continued their work in advocating for our business community, um, all size and sectors of business, uh, to make sure that the government decisions are aligned with what it is that we need in order to thrive, as well as offering uh, member benefits to help our business leaders uh, support each other and support their employees and continue to grow as well. So um, just to give you a few updates, we have been very active over the last few weeks in regard to the programs and policies that have been set by the government in regard to COVID-19, working with the members of our business community uh, to ensure that we are aligned in our positions. And uh, in the, I would say last week or so, we have also turned our attention, part of our attention uh, to the idea of recovery. And I'm, and I'm uh, happy to, to report that some of the thinking that has come out from the various discussion tables is around the government yet having to support us through recovery. Uh, but what we have really seen is in a tremendous amount of resilience and innovation among our entrepreneurs and business leaders. And that is what we know will take us through next uh, period of time as we rebound into um, a more successful and thriving community. So that's why today's presentation is particularly timely because uh, our two guests today are what are our community leaders who have demonstrated uh, over and over again. They are serial entrepreneurs and inspiring community leaders. Many of you will know and recognize them. And we're happy today to have the opportunity to delve a little deeper into their stories, and into their mindsets, and their own strategies for success. Please welcome uh, to today's panel, Carla Briones and Steve Cody. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Now, I hope it's okay to share that both of uh, these fine individuals are also active members and supporters of the Ottawa Board of Trade. And so we have, in addition to all of the um, community work that they do, they also are contributing to the prosperity of our community through the work of the Board of Trade. So uh, I didn't do the traditional introduction because what I was hoping is that each of you would... Um, be able to introduce yourselves and share your stories um, in a way that I could, that I always say I never could. And so I, th I think that you were prepared to do that. And so I'd love to hear sort of where you had come from in your, in your life and then in your entrepreneurial career and some of the challenges that you've faced and overcome and, and how you view your business today and into the future. So, so Carla, would it be okay if we started with you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, my 
My name is Carla Briones, and I, I always like to introduce myself by, um, by level of importance. First of all, I am an immigrant and I wear my immigrant um, status in my heart. I'm originally from Mexico. Um, I ha I'm a mom. I'm a, a mom of two amazing, brave little girls um and who have their own business actually uh they are 12 uh so almost 12 and uh, and seven and uh and i'm an entrepreneur here in ottawa um i arrived into canada in a u-haul truck so i actually yeah. my family and i drove all the way from the north of mexico it took us about six days if i remember correctly wow. in the middle of the summer in a u-haul truck with no air conditioner and a cat on my lap um and we came here because um i'm from the north of mexico bordering with texas and uh in the late 90s which is i came in the 97 um the that's when the drug cartels and like the narco um world was um, starting to become really active in the north of Mexico um, and it became very dangerous um, to to live there. So um, we bypassed the idea of going to the States and uh, and we came to Canada and I'm a daughter of entrepreneurs. My dad's a, a veterinarian doctor. He had his hospitals in, in Mexico um, and we we basically sold everything. We completely uprooted ourselves to to come to Canada. I had just finished high school. And uh, yeah, and then we lived your typical immigrant experience. I always joke that my dad didn't drive a cab because the gas station called first. Um, so he was selling uh, gas, well, not the gas station, but gas contracts from door to door. Uh, and eventually he ended up uh, opening his, his hospital here much, 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 much later. Um, yeah, and I went to school uh, to Carleton in journalism. I graduated from journalism of all things. And then uh, as my dad and my mom opened their, their hospital on Montreal Road, I kind of, I always think that, or I always find that entrepreneurship is contagious. So I got so excited for them and, and, and I kind of wanted to join into the entrepreneurship world. And uh, I, in my previous life, I was in public relations. That's what I worked for six years in Toronto. And then uh, I got a dog and it's the dog that changed my life. And the dog <laughs> that, that, uh, that steered me in the direction of opening uh, Global Pet Foods, which is uh, a store in Canada that I have. And then a year later, I opened another one in Hintonburg. And then um, about three and a half years ago, I opened uh, Freshy. So as you can see, it's mostly franchises, um, Canadian franchises. Um, but uh, the reason why I did franchises is that as an immigrant, it was, it was hard to know how the system worked here in Canada. So it actually helped me, um, you know, steer me in the right direction. And then uh, two years ago, I opened my consulting business to help other immigrants open up um, not only um, good businesses, but scalable businesses. Um, and I'm a business advisor at Invest Ottawa as well. So I, I live and breathe entrepreneurship. I always joke that some people think in numbers, some, some people think in colors of the rainbow, some people think in like musical notes, and I think in, in business, like every time, like I open and close about 100 businesses in my, in my head every <laughs> single day. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. Um, so yeah, so I I, and I, I love being part of the uh, a very welcoming community and I consider myself super lucky to to be living in Canada. Thank you. And I think you were, you were recognized in, within the just the last couple of years as well, weren't you, by the city? Yeah, the, the city of Ottawa um, named the uh, Immigrant Entrepreneur of the Year along with another, wow. group, another group. So yeah, very it was good. Really cool. We're, we're so lucky to have you here. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Good. Steve? Hi. What's your story? Yeah, yeah. well, that was an amazing story. I mean, that's really <laughs> inspirational, and thank you for sharing that. Um, so a little different at my end. So I'm from Ottawa. Uh, uh, was raised by a single mom, and uh, we moved everywhere. Probably went to about 12 different schools growing up. Uh, I was dyslexic, so by the time I was in grade 10, my grandfather had saved $10 a month for me, so his plan was that I would go to university. So by this time, there was $1,200 in the bank, 
uh, school wasn't going too well. So I went to him and I said, look, can I take the $1,200 out of the bank and start a window cleaning business? And uh, my, my grandmother kind of convinced them. And uh, so anyways, kind of was able to buy a, a ladder, squeegee bucket and whatever you need to do to start a window cleaning company. And uh, so we started Cody, Cody Window Cleaning. Uh, quickly discovered I was scared of heights. So that was, uh, was probably not a good thing. But uh, anyways, um, it's still around today. It's been sold twice. Uh, went from that, uh, you know, we were renting swing stages and machines that came down the side of buildings. We were renting them from local companies. And I said, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe I should buy them and I'll start renting them. Uh, so we started a swing stage rental company, scaffolding rental company, Bobcats. Uh, then we had a lift rental company. All of them kind of built and sold. The lift one we sold to uh, Hertz when I was uh, 30 years old. Um, so at that time, we had uh, five kids. Uh, decided to take a year off. And uh, during that time, my mom was getting married and we had to rent some tables and chairs. I didn't like that experience, so I said, okay, well, I'll start a party rental business. Uh, so we started Cody Party. I think that's, now we're celebrating 21 years. Um, and then we started Monster Halloween, if you're familiar with that. Um, you know, just I literally, ha Halloween season, went into a, a spirit store, and man, the store was so busy, and I was in there with the kids, and by the time I left the store, I think like Carla, I said, okay, we're getting the Halloween business. So anyway, so we, uh, we did that, uh, Cody Mobile. Um, and then, um, so we had, you know, we were franchising these business. So we were the franchisors. We had 13 Cody parties across the country. I think 26 Monster Halloweens, Cody Mobile, which was like mobile auto detailing. Uh, and that was just my wife kept getting mad because the car was never clean enough. I never had time to bring the car to get it detailed because that was like, you have to drop it off and pick it up. So I just, I said, look, I'm going to start my own just mobile detailing business. So that's kind of why we started that, but then it solved the problem. Um, so our life changed June, 2013. Uh, our son passed away from a drug overdose. Uh, so at that time, you know, everything was great. Three companies on the go. And I think where that becomes uh, very relevant now is, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, totally got, uh, I couldn't get out of bed. The only way I get out of bed was either a hot bath or a long walk because my anxiety was too high. So we had a fire sale on uh, all three businesses, uh, basically gave them away, had a close to $2 million in debt. Everybody said go bankrupt. And anyways, we kept fighting, but we did have the technology. Uh, we had built our own technology to run these businesses. Uh, I know nothing about technology, but you know, August of 2014, I felt better. And I said, you know what, I'm going to turn this into a product. That's all we have. Uh, so we started better software, um, joined Elspark, which we we're lucky to get into. Uh, we raised $9.8 million kind of, uh, in about two and a half, two years, I guess, uh, didn't know much about that. So we ended up with some VCs and things like that. I really didn't like that experience. Uh, so I left that company that I had built, uh, June, 2017, started Ruckify with my partner, Bruce Linton. Uh, and we actually ended up buying better software back from the VCs, uh, seven months after I left. So that was kind of rewarding. Um, so today, uh, we, we have Ruckify, which is a, uh, it's like the Airbnb of anything rentals, um, and when all this happened, uh, we were doing our go-to-market launch in Austin, Texas. I had bought a one-way ticket there with a bunch of other people on our team. We were 81 people. Um, and I can remember March 11th, everything was good. March 12th, everything got weird when I was Austin. When I was in Austin, March 13th, uh, I was on a plane heading home. And that's when everything changed. So that's, uh, so that's kind of my story. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, talk about serial entrepreneur. I think probably your photo is in the dictionary beside that. <laughs> now, Carla said that um, she uh, she felt like she got her entrepreneurial spirit from her parents and that it was contagious. Where, where do you think you got it, Steve? Have you ever pondered that? Uh, you know what? Well, my mom is a house cleaner, so I, I'd have to go with her. She couldn't afford a babysitter, so I'd be there you know, helping her clean the house, and you kind of knew – you went in, you cleaned the house, and typically there was cash sitting on the table or the counter. So I think that kind of stays with you, right? You did a little work, you got paid right away, and you did it kind of on your own time. So I don't know, maybe that's, you know, 
Well, anyways, I was dyslexic. Like, I had no choice. <laughs> Nobody would ever hire me, so, yeah. And then what would you say have been, over the course of your career, what would you say that you – uh, are the biggest benefits of being an entrepreneur or what are you most grateful for? And to, because there's, there's, you know, there is a lot, there are a lot of rewards, but there are a lot of challenges in being an entrepreneur and, and a lot of entrepreneurs are being challenged right now in a, um, in a, in a different environment than any of us could have expected. So what would you say are sort of the unique things to be grateful for as an entrepreneur or the unique challenges? <laughs> uh, for, well, for yeah, I, I mean, personally, I mean, it's not. Oh, oh, go ahead, ahead. Go, go. Go. <laughs> I want to hear yours. Oh, okay, well, um, I'm grateful that um, I was able to to create my own path. Mm -hmm. um, when I opened the first door, I was also a new mom, so my I had my 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 newborn with me so it was really cool to be able to um, bring her with me to work and it was also very challenging mm -hmm. and uh, many times she slept in dog beds and many times she took a bath in like the, the grooming tub for the grooming salon that we have there um, but nobody like I, I kind of I did I did what I needed to do in order to be a mom and be an entrepreneur uh, that's back then. Now, uh, I guess the challenge is, is as you get bigger and as you have more staff and as you have um, bigger responsibilities, the challenge is how to how to orchestrate everything in a way that you are working on the business and not in the business, mm -hmm. and also finding time uh, as a woman entrepreneur. Uh, finding time to be able to also nurture your children in a way that you don't come across as bossing them around mm -hmm. um, or talking them to, uh, you know, as employees. It's, it's, it, there's all, it's, it's a challenge, I find. Mm -hmm. um, and in situations like that, it's a challenge that you, you like, like, like right now with COVID, where all of a sudden all the hard work that you've been putting on your business, um, the government all of a sudden mandates that that you know like, it's not up to you it's up to the government right now where um to tell you at what capacity you're allowed to work um so the challenge is how do how do we make that work and, and how do we make uh ends meet and how do we keep our staff and how do we uh, stay sane um and and how do we pivot so that so that we can we can continue you know uh putting food on the table mm -hmm. so yeah thank you Steve? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think the most exciting part about being an entrepreneur is I think we're a lot like artists. So we get to have these blank canvases and you kind of pick whatever paint you want and you get to create something and mold it into whatever you want. So for me, that's, I don't like running a company. I like building a company. Um, so anyways, that's, uh, that's really, really fun. And the other part is you get to build people. Uh, just like you're able to kind of build a company, you're able to take people and, you know, they're, they end up doing things they never thought were possible. They didn't, never even saw themselves doing it. And I mean, I still meet guys from window cleaning or auto detail. Like, it's just amazing. Right. So, and their lives have been changed and, uh, and my life's been changed. I learned so much from them. So, uh, so I think that that's grateful, uh, you know, in terms of, of challenges, uh, I mean, I like the challenges, uh, so I don't, I don't, I mean, that's kind of what gets me up in the morning. Um, I think the, the toughest thing is just probably not working too much. So that's like literally all I do is work. Um, my kids all work with us. So to me, I consider that success. Uh, you know, that's our, fa like our family time is literally working. Uh, so, I, you know, that that's a bit odd. I wish maybe we could be a normal family sometimes and... <laughs> Do normal things, that? but it's just I just can't. <laughs> yeah. it's like I just can't do it. So and it works for us, anyways. Yeah. We've done uh, we've done a few interviews with uh, business leaders over the years, and one of the things that we do always ask about is this idea of life balance, right? Because I think entrepreneurs are traditionally known as being challenged in that way, and uh, we've had some great. Um, responses to that in terms of how people handle that 
And um, so, Steve, you pretty much admitted that you don't handle it at all. <laughs> Work-life work integration, and it's like well, <laughs> and that is a, that is a concept that has really you know come to fruition, particularly in today's world where we're so connected all of the time. It's and and so I've heard this t uh, a term life harmony instead of life balance, and um, and I remember one of our <clears throat> uh, uh, Dr. Theus. Uh, from the um, Ottawa Hospital, who is a very challenging role, and she said she would do it in blocks of time. So she might not get home for dinner every night at six o'clock, but that she would take chunks of time off to spend with her family, and that's what worked in her situation. So Carla, how do you handle the life balance challenge? <laughs> Well, it, it really helps that I, um, the staff, the, my, my support staff are really, really good. So my, my managers have been with me 10 years. So they know the business inside out. So I'm able to have a little bit of balance and have um, some family life because they are so invested in the business. Um, however, I mean, my kids were born in the business, right? Like they, that's all they know. They don't know anything different so for them you know they're sick and and they can't go to school and I remember you know a story <laughs> six years ago when my daughter was like I think she was six years six years yeah six six years old yeah and uh of course you know it's the busiest day I was still working it was at the time where I was still working in the business and um and she got sick so I had to bring her to work and of course, that's the day that is the busiest day. And it's, of course, the day that everybody calls in sick. So I was alone with a sick child managing everything. And there was a moment where I'm like, Nayeli, her name is Nayeli. I'm like, I really need you at the front <laughs> because I had her in the office. And she's like looking at me, like, you know, always. <laughs> you wait like not feeling right I'm like, you know what Nayeli? I really need you to help me um, run these transactions I'll I'll show you how to scan um, the products and and she did and I remember feeling so guilty because we uh, you know it took like, maybe like three hours until the next staff came and then we didn't ha I didn't have time to feed my child and I felt like the worst mother in the world. And then, you know, like a few years later, last year, I was remembering this and I was feeling that dread, you know, that oh, man, I, I really, I really messed it up. So I went to Nayeli, she's older now. And I'm like, Nayeli, I just, I just, I just really want to apologize for that day, you know, trying to be like the, you know, the, 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 the conscious mother. And like, I really want to apologize. I, I know I probably fail you that. And, and you probably felt like, like you had all of these responsibilities and you were so little. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, that was the best time. Like, I remember that day and I felt so cool because I was scanning products. So, so yeah. So even like, sometimes I, I feel that I don't have any balance and that I'm involving my kids too much, but I'm, but you know, like she just told me like, that was, that was the best thing that could have ever happened on a sick day for her. Yeah. So yeah, so it, it is integration. <laughs> she gives you about like from my experience, we did that, but they afterwards, like when they get really old, they accuse you of child labor. Oh yeah. So, yeah they want to <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for that one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so life balance. I mean, it also helps that that the the very supportive partner. So my husband is very supportive and and like very involved in 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 our kids lives as well like so he's very hands-on so that helps a lot too of course yeah and steve have you you work with your wife and your business as well you work with your wife and your businesses as well it's a family affair you said oh can you hear me okay i think steve might be a little bit frozen uh, oh, we'll just give it a minute. Are you there, Steve? Oh, so these these are the challenges of virtual events. <laughs> I might uh, I might circle back to Steve Carlos. Yeah, so no, that's okay. It's pretty. Yeah. Are you there? Uh, you're totally broken up. So I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if it's my end or your end. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Can you hear me now? 
we'll give them a minute. So Carla, one of the things that um, we are most impressed about with you and with Steve is that uh, despite all of the dedication that you have to your business and obviously to your family, you also still find time to dedicate um, your time and energy to community development. So can you, can you share with me sort of what inspires you to do that and maybe share some of the work that you do in the community and what inspires you to do that? Uh, I think, well, the biggest thing I think we do is uh, on the opioid side. So our, our son died from basically a fentanyl overdose. So we ended up, uh, we didn't have any energy to get involved. It took us about two years to be able to do something about it. We had tried to do something before he passed away, um, but it, it, we just couldn't. Um, and afterwards, we very much got involved in um, just trying to get the government to be more involved, uh, be more supportive. And uh, I'm not political at all, but Justin Trudeau's done an absolutely amazing job. Uh, they put a task force together, first time ever with Health Canada, uh, giving away a million dollar prize for whoever can come up with the best uh, drug testing technology. And I was asked to chair the selection committee on that. So anyway, so that obviously means a lot to us and, you know, uh, and because it, it impacts family, it impacts communities. Um, and I think, so the other side of it is, you know, through COVID, um, and like, uh, you know, I go back to when, when we lost Nicholas and how we felt after that. And I think this is no different, right? That was loss. And I think people are feeling loss right now. It could be loss of team members, could be loss of potentially loss of your business. So I don't know. I think that that just kind of, I just feel like however I can do it is fight on people's behalf, um, to try to make that better or, you know, whatever, like, so just, you know, so working with trying to work with BDC, trying to work with EDC, what are the guidelines? Uh, is this emergency funding? What is your mandate? You know, like we need clarity because nobody's really getting money. I think everybody's extremely well intended, uh, but you know, the small business owners aren't at the table. They don't have a voice. We really don't understand what's happening. So uh, that's a, just another big part of it right now, I think, is is on that side. And I think, you know, uh, you know anyways, there's going to be landlords that are, you know, they're right now we're getting predatory landlords uh, that are, you know, uh, I saw a thing last night on, on Facebook where uh, somebody had sent me something where a landlord is giving an, basically effectively an eviction notice for uh, for because April rent wasn't paid and April isn't even over. But you know what they're looking for? They're looking to re to claim all of the uh, all of the assets basically in that restaurant, right? So if they can kick the uh, the tenant out, the person who paid for all that stuff, uh, they get all those fit ups. So that's predatory. You know, a lot of good landlords, but there's going to be some. There always is some some bad people. So, anyways, if I can help advocate, whatever. I'm not in that situation, but. That's yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. And I know you have dedicated a lot of time and energy to helping out the members of our business community in this situation. And, uh, and I know you're doing some work with United Way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Through, uh, yeah. I mean, we did a lot of work with Ruckify with the floods. Um, and we were able to help a lot of uh, people save their homes, basically. And, you know, and I wasn't, I didn't do it. Somebody from Constance Bay came and said, can we help? Uh, can we get pumps? Can we get generators to the homeowners? I said, look, use Rockify, use anybody you need. The only rule is you can't, nobody's allowed to make money, uh, but, you know, throw whatever resource you, so resource you need and the team made it happen. In this case, we kind of wondered, well, how can we help um, with Rockify and United Way came uh, knocking basically. And we never even, never even occurred to us, but laptops are lifelines. You know, if, if you've got a mental health issue or, or whatever it is, it's like very, very powerful. So, uh, so we've been very successful with them in Ottawa. I think we've uh, provided uh, laptops and things to about 38 community groups, plus a lot of individuals. We're working down in Austin. We've got 14,000 we're looking for there. We just kicked off Calgary. We're working with Shaw. Uh, and then Toronto, we've got a couple of major partnerships. We're looking to work with people there as well. Okay. So very good. Yeah. Carla, you evidently have a love for community and community leadership and inspiring others. What motivates you to do that work? Honestly, it goes back to my immigrant roots. It, it goes back to the appreciation that I have for 
the community to have welcomed me and my family into Canada. So it's it's just like a lifelong debt that I feel that that I have with with this country and this community that has been able to support um, support me in in the, the businesses that that we have. So it's it's sort of like my way of giving back. Um, yeah, and and I think it's it's the right thing to do as well. Like it's just um, I I don't think about it. Like it just uh, to me is the right thing to do. Um, for example, on my global pet food side of things, I have a program where uh, I remember um, driving one day in one of the like the bridges in in Ottawa, and I saw a homeless man with a with a dog. And it really broke my heart. So I ended up going back to him and providing him with, um, you know, food and whatnot. And then I started questioning how many people are like that and where those animals are their lifelines. And a lot of the time, these animals are way better behaved and they're way better taken care of than the regular house pet. So, um, so I, I did a big campaign about raising funds for vet care for these animals. Again, you know, being very connected with my dad as a vet veterinarian, uh, but for free vet care and um, like vaccination, neutering, spaying, uh, food, so on and so forth. And now I, I work with the um, Salvation Army. So whenever they encounter um, a new person that uh, is homeless, a passive, a, a pet, they have carte blanche so they can just call me whenever they, 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 they have my cell phone number, uh, particularly in the winter, that's, that's when I get the most calls. Um, and I just open the store and they're like, take whatever you need. Um, so that's on that side. On the COVID side, um, uh, my brother works at the, the hospital and, uh, and I remember having a conversation with him and saying, oh my God, I haven't eaten all day and it's been crazy. So, um, so I sent him food and then I'm like, wait a minute, what about if I, if I ask the community to help out and fundraise to feed everybody in the hospitals? Um, and I was very open about it too, because I'm like, well, if I fundraise, my, my business is going down by 80%, but if I fundraise, I can, it's a triple win. Like the, the, I, because people were asking me, how can we help? How can we help? So I can give people an opportunity to help. I can bring revenue into the business, but then we can also together help feed the front line. So, um, so yeah, we started doing that and that's worked. Um, that's worked very well. Um, so yeah, it's just, um, I guess, I guess a lot of the things is like a personal thing or like, you know, I don't know, as a woman, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm very um, sensitive. <laughs> I don't know, but for me, it's like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it seems the one thing that both of you have in common is the, the moment you see a gap, you figure out a way to fill that gap. <laughs> the moment you see the need, you, feel, you find a way. And, and I think that's probably common among entrepreneurs, but to have that strong sense of community as well, uh, we're very grateful for both of you to, to, to be in Ottawa. So um, I know that, um, that both of you are very sensitive to what's going on right now with COVID and, and helping others and being a voice. I know Carla you, uh, and Steve, you've both uh, been active on social and in the public media around what it is that we're going through now. If, um, if you could offer some advice to to our business community about how to uh, maintain resilience, to be committed to innovation, and to foster within yourself as an entrepreneur the characters required to get us through this time. What, what would you say to the, to the business leaders, to the entrepreneurs during this time? You wanna go ahead, Carla? Uh, sure. Um, what would I say? I say that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and especially right now, as having, well, I, I, at least for me, having a sense of community or finding some sort of community, um, it's, it's really important um, because all of a sudden they took away the ability to connect in person with, 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 with your peers. So having, you know, participating in stuff like this so that you feel connected to other entrepreneurs so that you can be inspired by other entrepreneurs, what they're doing and how they're adapting and all of that is contagious and, and that energy is contagious. So I would definitely recommend people to, to, to continue to, to reach out to other entrepreneurs. Um, and also adapting, like being able to adapt. So think, I think of, of, um, 
of a situation like that, that if we are like stiff as a tree, we're going to break. But if we're malleable and flexible in the adapting at the situation, like a willow tree or like a bamboo, we're going to be able to survive. And we just need to think about, um, think about other things that we can do pivoting or, you know, if you want to, that, that word's been overused, but <laughs> like coming up with different solutions and, very importantly, again, that's something that I really stand behind is doing good to the community is good for business. Um, like doing something genuinely um, good for the community, whether it is through your business, um, having you know that social responsibility to your community, it is really good for business. Your community will respond to that. Um, so yeah, so like reaching out, being flexible and adaptable and, um, and and doing good, doing genuine good in the community. That's fantastic. Thank you. Steve? Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, for me, I'll just go back on, on you know, our, the, probably the toughest time in our life. And this is another tough time. There's no question. Probably, you know, for a lot of people, even tougher. Um, so I think taking care of yourself is probably the most important thing. Because uh, if you you know, if you can't think clearly and if you don't have energy, it's really hard to kind of do anything and uh, be able to survive this. So, you know, exercise or wh whatever it is for you to do that. So I think that that's number one. Uh, number two is, you, you know, I mean, don't, don't give up. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's some days where you're going to feel like giving up, but you don't have to give up. Uh, but in saying that, it doesn't mean you have to do things the same way as you did them before COVID. And you can't rely just on the government and you can't rely on other people. You kind of have to look within and make things happen. We went from being in the party rental business and in the costume business to being in the technology business. And my kids, like they couldn't stop laughing when I told them I was starting a software company. Right. But it's kind of all I had left and I turned it into something. And I think everybody's got something that they can turn into something. And it's, 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 it's just, you, you have to be careful to not hang on to the past too much. I think you have to think more about the future and, uh, and adapt to that future. So I think, uh, and I'll, I'll echo uh, what Carla says in terms of giving back to your community. Uh, if I look at just Rockify alone right now, I think we're up like 400% pre COVID. And a lot of that has to do with earned media. Uh, we've probably got, we're just under 50 earn media spots that we've had in multiple cities and you know we went from spending two to three hundred thousand a month on marketing we haven't spent five thousand dollars since COVID started on marketing uh but because we're doing all this good people want to share that and uh and and it's just a better way to get into the community so you know it's just don't give up there's always always a way to make it happen I appreciate you saying that, and, and it's a good point. I mean, obviously you are inspired as people and it's part of your character to give back, but it also does have a benefit of keeping you connected to the community and the community developing a, a following. Um, I, I remember a couple of years ago we had, what's his name, Brett from uh, the Dragon's Den? Oh, Brett's an investor. Yeah, so Brett, Brett you were is, there, yeah. Steve. Yeah. He's an investor. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, that's why. What's his name, Brett? Wilson. Wilson. Yes. He's a, he's and a good I, guy. Never, I never forget him saying that as an entrepreneur, study entrepreneurship, study marketing, and study philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. And those were the three pillars in his mind. And so, you know, when there's that added benefit of everybody benefiting, then I think success does follow and, and both of you are an example of that so so thank you for for sharing that um, I, I, I was sorry I was looking down because I started taking notes of the things that you said <laughs> it's like I, I have to use that and I and we have to reshare that so um, I appreciate both of you sharing that we're just about 20 to the hour now and so I just wanted to open it up to some of our guests to see if there are specific, if you think you're open to Q and A, yeah. um, to see if there are specific questions that people might have um, for either one of you. So, um, if there's any questions, you can just put up your hand, and I might see you or put it in the chat. 
if you have questions that you want to ask either Carla or Steve. And then I will just ask Lynn, maybe if you can help me, um, if you can help me by uh, monitoring the chat line, that would be great. Absolutely. Right. Um, I know that uh, we've heard this probably a lot over the last few weeks, and it's not a new concept, but when you're under stress, as we are as a, as a global community right now, um, it really brings out um, the true character of uh, people in your in your government or in your network or even in your staff teams and um, and it's an opportunity for true leaders to either shine or not shine <laughs> and so I would be curious to ask both of you as 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 leaders in our community what kind of characteristics would you say um, are most important in terms of effective leadership? Being leaders that people want to follow, what kind of characteristics in your experience does, do you see consistently? Do you want to go, Carla? Sure. Um, I, think, I think the vulnerability, believe yeah. it or not. I think vulnerability, having leaders that are um, vulnerable enough to talk about the good things but also to talk about the not so great things it humanizes that that leader and it makes for a leader that is more genuine and and easier to relate to and easier to want to follow so for me personally i find vulnerability a, a key um a key piece in effective leadership um, and I mean, vulnerability doesn't mean like crying in every meeting, but just being true to yourself and being true to your values and, and, and talking about the good and the bad. Um, yeah. So for me, vulnerability is key and, uh, and being genuine, um, but also being, um, uh, you know, inspirational and, and, and that leader that, that people want to follow, um, through strategy as well. So yeah, vulnerability is, is big for me. Awesome. Steve? Uh, yeah, definitely vulnerability. I think uh, I, one of the things I try to do is transparency. Yeah. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you can be transparent and you kind of pay a price for that. Uh, so I, I've kind of questioned that a couple of times. But, you know, right to the, I mean, our team, they know how much money we have in the bank, what the runway is. Like, literally, there's nothing that I don't tell them. Okay. And, uh and you know, uh, and I, sometimes you get criticized for that. But I think if you're going to bring people along for the journey in our team, they own 10% of the company, everybody's an owner, so they should know uh, for that reason. But I think transparency equals trust. And nobody's going to follow you if they don't trust you. Um, so that's the biggest thing. Thank you. So Ling, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, first one is from Dave Donaldson, and he wants to know from Carla and Steve um, what the biggest challenges coming out of the pandemic are for, in your view. Hmm. Who'd like to start with that? Steve, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> That's a tough sure. question. It is. Yeah. You know, you didn't I want a soft question, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What worries me most, I think, is supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, I think supply chains are going to break. And when they start breaking, that, ha that creates dominoes. So, you know, if you look at Bangladesh, uh, I think three and a half billion dollars in orders have been canceled. And in Bangladesh, that means a lot more to us than it does here. The migrant workers are all gone. Joe Mimran, so he owns Joe Fresh, uh, you know, he's, he's on our board and we were talking about it, like all these people are gone, all these factories are closing, and then the wholesalers, wherever this is going, they, they're not selling, the retailers aren't paying them, so, and you're seeing, now you're talking, you're hearing it about it in the, in the, in the food uh, supply line, or supply, you know, the, the supply chain, so I think just the because we're a connected world and the problem with COVID is we're completely fragmented and border like borders kind of have to go up just to contain it and to control it um and that's going to affect supply lines and uh anyways you know if you and i it's unfortunately 
it's the bigger companies like the Walmarts and the Amazons, they've got proprietary uh, supply lines. Uh, you know, they're going to win more than the small guys are, I think, at the end of the day, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, second question from the chat is coming oh, up. Carla didn't, Car Sorry? Carla didn't answer. Car oh, Carla, 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 that's Carla. an answer, yeah. Carla, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, for me, it's actually the other side of the coin is uh, how do you regain um, uh, consumer confidence to, to actually uh, come to your businesses? Uh, you know, how, what is, so to me, that's a, the, big, and the biggest challenge, obviously being in a, in a very um, B2C business is how do I regain or how do I, I, I get that confidence or give that confidence to my customers that is safe to come to my restaurant or that is safe to come to my, to my businesses, but also how do I reassure my staff that they are safe by by working in the front lines as well. So that to me, that's that's a that's a huge challenge that I'm already seeing right now, and and I'd be interested and curious on 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 how that's going to evolve. Thank you. Uh, so the next question that was posted in the chat is from Amanda, and she wants to know how you motivate yourself when you encounter very difficult times, either personally or professionally, and get back to success when you're not really feeling successful? Mm. <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> first. Uh, <laughs> how do I motivate myself? You know what? Um, I have a really good example with my parents. So I always go back to thinking, man, they had it tougher than I did. And yet they still manage to succeed. They still manage to, to do it. So I always look at my parents and they're like a huge source of inspiration. So I, I you know, I have my cry first, right? Like I, 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 I give myself permission to crumble. I have my big ugly cry. And then I kind of try to reframe it and see, okay, what, what will my parents have done <laughs> uh, in my situation or what would my parents tell me in, in my situation. So I have very supportive parents, which is, is pretty cool. Um, and then, and then I kind of think about what other situations had I been that I've been able to succeed at and, and try to reframe it and, and think about the good and, and, you know, who are the people that are surrounding me? What is the positive that is surrounding me? My family, my, you know, my kids, like I try to focus on the positive. It's hard sometimes it's hard to get out of that funk um but again being vulnerable enough to say i'm in a funk and then and then accept it talk about it and then like kind of go through the funk and 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 trying to come uh better on the other side i'm not saying i'm perfect um it takes time but but uh, definitely looking back and, and seeing the success that, that my parents had and the inspiration that they've given me, it's, it's a big source of, of, of motivation for me. And Steve, how do you uh, get back to feeling successful when you're not feeling successful? Yeah. Well, first off, my wife kicks my ass. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> And she does it two ways. So number one is it's always, to me, it's a lot about disconnecting and being able to think. So two ways to disconnect from technology, basically. Mm. Uh, go for a walk without a cell phone, and it's got to be over 40 minutes, or go for a long drive. So if I go for a dr drive, and that's really what my wife, uh, that's, you know, she'll see it sometimes before I see it. Mm. And, uh, and just to have that thinking time, I think, is uh, it, it just reduces the anxiety clears your head and uh, it just gives you that new foundation to start building off of again. Nice. I love Can I share um, something on that too. Sure. Um, one of the best, just to, to Carla's point about, you know, giving yourself permission. One of the best stories I ever heard was, um, uh, you know, that really everything that happens is an event and how we feel about it has to do with the story we create around the event, right? So like even the pandemic, it's, it's, it's factual. It's an event that is happening and every one of us are creating a different story or have a different scenario around it. 
And I heard this one uh, speaker one time saying, just decide how much time you want to spend on every, you know, every piece of it. So he was telling a story of his son who just bought a brand new car and within the first day the car got totaled, right? And it's like, you know, so the event was the car got totaled. The story he created was either, you know, I move on or I, I completely get devastated by this. And it's like, and how much time do you want to invest in it? You know, do you want to invest a day? feel sorry for a day, but then, and then move forward. So yeah, like, like being very specific about how much time you want to invest in, in how, in that story you're creating. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, I have to say that I'm, uh, I love how for both Carla and Steve, um, you're both very family oriented. And I love that. I, I sense that family inspires you, keeps you together. You work together as teams. And that's just amazing to me. And I absolutely love that. So good for both of you. We have uh, one other question in the chat and I think it's gonna go to Carla first. Um, it's from Kelly and Kelly wants to, says she works with newcomers connecting them with employers. What advice could I share with my clients that will give them hope that their career goals can be actualized during these difficult times? Mm, that is challenging. It's a great uh, question though. It's a huge question, yeah, but it's a great question to ask and to keep asking. Um, I would, I mean, there, there's still, I'm not sure if Kelly, Kelly, if, if you know of World Skills, World Skills is an organization that actually helps um, newcomers find um, jobs or, or they retrain them um, so that they can find jobs in their careers. And they're still active, they're still doing it. So connecting with the settlement organizations that are, uh, or connecting them with the settlement organizations that are um, focused on on, on those specific goals. So World Skills is one, uh, Intac is one, uh, it's another one. So there's 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 not many, but the ones that do exist here in Ottawa are really really good. Um, so yeah, so that would be my recommendation right now. But it is tough, particularly with uh, with what's going on right now. Steve, did you have any comments that you wanted to add to that? I I just you know we've had many uh, new Canadians. I you know I can think of Ariel. He was a Cody Party franchisee, he came from Cuba. Uh, I mean, just any time a new Canadian's kind of joined our company or bought a franchise, the, the country needs them because they're the, you know, they're just so much energy and so positive about things. So when I think of, you know, when I talk to somebody today and, and I know that they're new to Canada, you know they're gonna survive because mm -hmm. they've seen worse and this is like cakewalk mm -hmm. right so uh, I know I'm very inspired by uh, by, new, by new Canadians. So Lynn? And I would just add Lynn you know it's it's kind of the same advice that we've been giving to to some of our current entrepreneurs is that you know there are we have limitations during this time but it's a time to prepare and connect and think about um, how we can be innovative. So I would say it's, you know, it's, it's not a time necessarily to stand still. Any success requires planning and connecting and learning new information. And so that work can definitely be done in this time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and if we have our way, recovery is not flung off, so. <laughs> <laughs> so get ready now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think we're getting close. You're welcome, Kelly. Um, I think we're getting close to our hour. So I might just open up the floor to Carla and Steve to say, do you have any final comments that you would like to share with our business community today? Do you want to go ahead, Carla? <laughs> Sorry. Steve has a skill that we have identified here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's called delegation. I know. <laughs> He's going by the uh, ladies first. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, just, I can't do it any other way. I'm sorry. Um, not really. Just a lot of gratitude and and appreciation to the business community that uh, that that Ottawa has is is um, it's it's a very supportive community and it's a very um, collaborative community, which is very refreshing. 
Um, so yeah, no, so I'm just, I'm just very grateful to be part of this and to be able to contribute uh, in any way, shape or form that I can. Thank you. Steve, any yeah, final I mean, I, I feel fortunate that I can use some of my kind of war wounds and past experiences to kind of, you know, help maybe people navigate through this. Um, so anybody out there, if there's any way I can help or do anything, uh, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. More than happy to do it. You know, we're so lucky to live in this country and we're so lucky to live in this city. And it's going to take all of us. It's not going to be the government's not going to save us. It's not going to be an individual that's going to save us. It's going to, a community of people is what's going to save us. And, uh, you know, so try to be part of that community. You may not have any energy or, but just do something, contribute. And, uh, and I th you know, we're all going to get through this and it'd be really nice to get through this and just be a closer community, which I think we're going to be. So thank you. I think I thank you for that, Steve, and uh, and I, I agree with you. I think that uh, there are going to be uh, some significant benefits that come out of this time as we work together and how we shape our community moving forward. And uh, and you know there might be even opportunities for us not to just get out of this, but even surpass where we thought we could be. And that's what we're and that's what we hope for and that we plan for as a business community. Um, I honor you both for the work that you have done in creating a fine example in our community and how you have contributed back to our community. So uh, thank you so much for being here today and for uh, your inspiration. I encourage all of you here today to check out uh, the many businesses of both Carla and Steve. Uh, as you probably know, the Board of Trade is very keen at this time time and, and, and always and into the future to, uh, to put a light on the local independent business owners um, and see how we can support them now and during this, during this time and moving forward. So, so Car if you have a pet, see Carla. If you have lunch, see Carla. And if you want to be advised by Carla in business, please do. And then Steve, um, I lost track of your businesses, but I know there's a charity business for sure. <laughs> and of course, Ruckify is your newest endeavor, which is an amazing concept. And we, and we look forward to continuing to see it grow. So thank, thank you, you both. And we'll see and, you again. Soon. And just one testimonial for Steve. Yeah. I put something, I open up my Ruckify uh, store on, yeah. I, I did it on Tuesday, I think. And I got my first rental yesterday. Oh, yes. hey, 50 bucks. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I got 50 rent? bucks. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's definitely a consumer trend, but really, Steve, the other piece of it, right, is the environmental piece mm -hmm. yeah. that supports the idea of the, of the environment. Yeah, you know, we, we worry about driving our cars and the impact on the environment. And we've, we're, we've got a PhD doing a study right now. And if you buy a ladder, uh, that's basically the equivalent of driving your car for 200 miles, right? The impact on the environment. So why not rectify the ladder and uh, save the, you know, it's just, uh, just if we can share. And I think that if we look at, I mean, I'm looking at the skies now. I don't know about you guys. It's, we're not very polluted here, but the sky seems bluer. And we have people in Austin or LA and they're saying, you know, they're telling us how blue the skies are. Well, if we want to keep them blue, start sharing. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you. I hope everyone has a wonderful, healthy day, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Lynn, I'll turn it to you. All right. Thank you thank very you. much, Sue Ling, and to our guests. I just want to really quickly tell you about a couple of webinars that we have coming up next week. Uh, on May the 5th, our good friends at RBC and EDC and BDC are going to talk about accessing capital. I see uh, Ron Smith from RBC has been on our call today. Thank you, Ron, for helping me organize that one. And on May the 7th, the Business Sherpa Group is going to talk about opportunities and challenges in the talent market for SMEs. And uh, we just heard from Carla that obviously is a bit of a challenge right at the moment. So that'll be very, very interesting. And I am so excited to share a new webinar series that we're going to be launching next Wednesday on the 6th at 1 p.m. called Wellness Wednesdays. Uh, Ottawa Board of Trade obviously is a big believer in the fact that we need to keep everybody healthy and that's the only way that we'll be able to have a healthy economy as well. So our very first presentation is going to be with St. John Ambulance and they are going to talk about mental health first aid in the workplace. 
So that's going to be an amazing session. If you can join us, please do so. And like Suling, I wish you all a very healthy and prosperous day. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.